All right, let's give away some t-shirts here. Yeah. T-shirt giveaway. Put them in and How fly many them off. 14 reviews this week. What do the four magazines? 12, 13, 14. Okay. That's exactly right. And we're giving away four shirts. <laughs> and the shirts go to Foxy Lifts. Yeah. Da Mama. Da mama. Who's Mama? Yo Mama. <laughs> mama. UC Teeth. And Married with Muscle. Mm. Married with muscle. <laughs> All of you are winners. God, these guys are clever. Winner, man. winner, chicken dinner. How yeah. do they get their t-shirt, Doug? Send the name, the one I just read, to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Include your shirt size and your shipping address, and we'll get that right out to you. Lucky fuckers. Yep, yep. If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this upcoming episode of Mind Pump, we talk about my wonderful experience at the post office. We talk about uh, our time at Paleo FX. Um, it was awesome. And there were some unexpected things that we cover in this episode. But hang in there because then we get to all the good stuff and all the meat of the episode. And we answer some amazing questions. Uh, first question was pyramiding your workouts versus warm ups. Then we talked about our favorite entrepreneurial minds. We talked about how to maximize your business as a personal trainer. And then we talk about Pilates versus resistance training. Hmm. Uh, within those questions, we answered quite a bit. And a lot of the answers that came up were about priming, how to properly prime your body. As some of you may know, we offer a program called MAPS Prime that includes a self-assessment tool called a compass. You take the compass, you figure out your recruitment patterns, you figure out how to prime your body specifically to the way it moves so that you can do your 10-minute priming session before your workouts to maximize your workout. Now, you can find out more about MAPS Prime at mindpumpmedia.com. I want to just uh, publicly thank you two, three, for your patience with oh. me this morning. Oh, good. Yeah. That was... Uh, How miserable was that? Dude, let me tell you. It, so the, the next the person that tells me that they want federally controlled government anything i'm gonna punch them in the throat what, I, so that you said that you text us that while you were waiting in line to get your passport for you and your kids what, is that what everyone was talking about is that so, why or what, so what? so here's how it works right in order to do this process with kids both parents have to be there and you have to do it at the post office now the post office opens for the passports at 10 a.m and they close i think at three the post office if uh, well, let's just start. Let's just start there. So it opens at ten, right? My ex gets there to hold a place in line at six a.m. Remember, it opens at ten. Yeah, she gets there at six a.m. She's camping out. There's four people ahead of her. The reason why this happens is because the process is so fucking grueling, slow. Uh, I honest to God, it was like we were. It was they were frozen in time. There was, it was if they went any slower, they would have gone backwards. <laughs> So she's fourth in line. So I get there with the kids because I'm not going to bring the kids there at 6 a.m., right? So I have the kids. I bring the kids there at 9.30. So I'm like, right when they open, we're going to get in. We're going to get out. But I should have known better. 10 a.m., they open – no, sorry, 10.05, they open the doors. So they're five minutes late, which is good considering, you know, who's running it. We go in there, and it takes them – not exaggerating. The first two people that were in line, I'm like, cool, they're going to breeze through. Like, how long could this possibly take? One hour. One hour. For the first person. For the first two people. Holy. There's why? two more people ahead of us. Why? Because the process is so redundant and arduous and slow. Like, I'm watching them do this. And you could have used carrier pigeons and smoke signals <laughs> and carved stone. Okay. And you would have happened. You would have gotten there faster. I wrote four more maps programs while I was in line. That's how long. Wow. Awesome! It, can't it's, wait for those. It's so fucking ridiculous and slow that I can't understand why anybody would want our government to run anything. Because if Starbucks ran this, if if I wanted to get my passports from Starbucks, my I mean, if there were four people in front of me, you ever been in Starbucks with four people in front of you? How long does it take to get your fucking coffee? <laughs> yeah. It takes two minutes, right? It would, have, it would have been in and out. No, no, no. It takes forever. And the reason why it takes forever, and I want to rant for a second, and I don't care if I piss people off. I'm going to rant a little bit here. The reason why it sucks so bad, and by the way, it's archaic in there. It's completely archaic. I went in there five years ago. The place looks exactly the same. I think they're using the same computers. Yeah. The reason why it sucks so bad is because they don't go out of business. 
like they could suck as much as they want. The right. workers could be as slow as they want. Yeah, they're not firing anybody. They don't have to change the systems. They don't have to change the process. They don't have to update anything. It just is what it is, and it never. It always gets funding, no matter what. So they could fucking fuck off all day long and have this shitty system, and we're stuck with it. And no one else can do it, by the way. What we had to do, there is no private company that will do it, at least not in California, but I don't think anywhere. So we're stuck. So we're stuck waiting in line. It's like I'm in the Soviet Union waiting for bread. Like I have to sit there forever and wait for this shit. And this is our third attempt because the other time we waited, we got there when it opened, which was a mistake because we were, I'm not joking, at 10 a.m., if you show up when they're like five minutes before they open, the line is around the block and you're not going to get in. You'll be waiting forever and whatever the time, you know, the, the closing time shows up and they'll tell you, come back tomorrow. Like you ain't getting in. So it's just... It's insane. It's absolutely insane. I just wish I could, when I fill my taxes out, I could say on it, you get taxes, you get taxes, fuck you, <laughs> you don't get shit. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I'm not going to pay my taxes for this, but mm. this doesn't happen that way. So when you did get it done, I, can, I, got, I have my passport. I got to get mine renewed, by the way, um, which I think I, I can do in the mail. What? I can't remember. I, I went in and it was, when I went in, it was, I was all by myself. And it was with uh, the two kids. You have to have both kids there and both pr- parents present. And I understand. I know. I know. I mean, that makes sense, right? Because, God forbid, like one of the parents gets passports and then right, you know, takes kidnaps off. the kid or whatever. Right, of course, I get that. I get all that. It's just the 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 entire process is so incredibly. There, were, there was. I mean, because there was a line. Remember, there's a line around the around the block. It's like right? the, I remember. There's two people doing the whole thing. There's two people working the desk, and each time they have a customer, yeah. it's. This most redundant, ridiculous filling out of paperwork and they staple make you this pay to that. For the picture, right? The little picture, uh, dude. You, like, it's why like, do I want that? <laughs> you have to pay an eighty dollar fee here, a hundred and fifty dollar fee there. Uh, on top of that, there, you know, there's there's tax money going into it. On top of that, there, it's just, it's so painful. It's a cluster <laughs> of fuck. It's so bad. It's so fucking bad. It's weird because I I feel like there's not a lot that they really need you there for a photo. And the I I don't remember the questionnaire being that long. I think it took me a few minutes at most to fill it out. Maybe ten it's to like, twenty questions. I you know, remember. we walk up and they're like, "Okay, give me your dry, your photo IDs. I'm gonna make two photocopies here. Let me see the passports. Make two photocopies here. Sign this. Sign that. Fill this out. Uh, oh, here's another thing. We need three separate checks for each fucking area. Oh, if you don't pay with check, it's another you know two dollar fee. It's like back and forth here, that and the other. We we went in with everything photocopied and filled out because my plan was to get in and out, right? Because I'm trying to come to work, right? And it still took us when we got up there 20 minutes from everything filled out to being able to leave. Jeez, it's just it was. And I can't. Mine, wait. I can't wait till they control my health care. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I can't fucking wait, dude. <laughs> Let's all wait in line. It's just insane. On a positive note, we are coming off. Uh, what a fun weekend out in Austin, Texas. Oh, Paleo FX is beautiful. Yeah. What a what uh, a what a good. You know, it was it's awesome. We almost didn't go. Right. We we really didn't have any intention six months ago to go to Paleo FX. I don't remember. What made us even really look into going? I, I remember. Know. I remember Ben brought it up, and yeah. somebody else brought it up, and then when we realized that some of the other guys were going to be there, I thought, okay, this could be decent. Well, Austin is a, a great city. It seems to be like a, a central hub for um, for fitness. You know what I mean? Because there's you've got some really it's good a very podcasts. active city. You know, yeah, yeah, and you've got a lot of good podcasts that are based uh, out of there. Um, you have on it that's over there, and then other people were you know meeting up over there. I've been to a lot of uh, like fitness slash bodybuilding conventions, and this was actually it was very different. It's funny because they both have their own. Yeah, they have their own culture, though. I mean, so yeah. it was different, but it was very similar. Yeah, you yeah. Know, on the other end of the spectrum, so you know that was that was kind of fun and interesting to see how um, they ran with that. You know, because there's one one side of it you get a lot of the artificial and like all this like supplement heavy type of booths and then on this end it was like beef bone broth and fat <laughs> you know and that's like it i felt a lot of parallels As totally totally I, I i saw a lot of parallels to me at first at first i think we were really like excited because it was so different 
uh, than bodybuilding or we felt like it was so different because you didn't see any of those guys. Like there was no stringers walking around. <laughs> you know? There wasn't no, yeah, there wasn't any of that or like no tanning bed tans, no, no. bright colored, cool shoes, no mirror like, glasses, but there were blue blockers. Oh, there was, oh my God, <laughs> there were a lot of blue blockers. Everybody was wearing blue blockers. Well, yeah. so I, and that's how I feel like, right. So instead of we, we traded out the, you know, the douche, Atom- the atomic shoes, the for du- blue blockers. yeah, the douchebag, yeah. uh, mirrored sunglasses inside for blue blocker sunglasses inside. Yeah. Um, which was pretty funny to me, and I thought that it was a little over. I mean, we saw we saw a couple. I think I saw two or three families where the son, the daughter, the mom, and the husband all were wearing blue blocks. You know what's or, funny about that is yeah. when, when we were walking, we were right? walking around with Ben Greenfield. <laughs> And he was cracking up, and he's like, they're using blue blockers wrong. And he's like, you want light during the day. There's not a reason to wear – you shouldn't be wearing blue <laughs> blockers. doing it wrong. All yeah. the time. Uh, but there was uh, a lot of buffed hippies. So you saw – it was it was like a lot of um, – I saw a lot of dreadlocks, mm. but then they looked fit. Mm-hmm. There were a remarkable amount of people walking around in a public convention barefoot. Yeah. I went to – dude, there was this dude – people talking about their feelings. There was this dude who was – Making me uncomfortable. Who was – Pretty built. He looked pretty built, and but he was barefoot the whole time. You know, kind of looked like a buffed hippie, and walked right in the bathroom and just barefoot. Walk. Yeah, dude, the whole <laughs> I did, time. I did not see that. Oh yeah, he's grounding to everybody's peepee. Oh, so Ugh, I did not so catch funny. that. That must have been when we broke off a little bit. Then there was a meditation tent. Yeah, remember that? You had to take your shoes off and everything in there. I thought that was oh, a my bre- favorite that was part. a breastfeeding tent. There was a breastfeeding uh, tent. Same one, wasn't you it? You went in there. I don't. I didn't go in there. I went into the. <laughs> No, I saw the meditation like, tent. Did you guys go in here? Did you guys go in any? Of no, it? I didn't. I went in there. Yeah, yeah, I went in there with Taylor. Everything had fat in it. Mm. Uh, there was a lot of. Um, it's interesting to see the trend that uh, bulletproof coffee started. I saw a lot of things that you add to your coffee that had fat in them or collagen protein or something like that. So tell me, each of you, tell me what you liked and what you didn't like about the convention. What did you like? What did you not like? I thought the clothes were horrible. Oh, you don't like they, the had, they had like no style or like there was no presence for like apparel. You mm-hmm. know, you think in like that kind of a culture, man, somebody that has like cool gear would like just sweep up. That's a good point. You know, like there was none of that. And so I thought that was a missed opportunity. And uh, one of uh, my favorite part was in the back in the VIP section where we got to all hang out and do the psychedelic light. Oh, shows. that shit was. Oh, the lucid light. Oh man, that was fun. That was weird. It was really weird, and uh, it was just I don't know. It was what just did something you different? What did you see when you're underneath that? Under that? Uh, just like just like a kaleidoscope of color and shapes and stuff, and it was just like. Did it I feel mean, expansive? It's like somebody's like blasting you with a strobe light is basically what it was, but it, it there was some of it that was like. I mean, it was kind of trippy. I'll be honest. It felt expansive at one point, right? Like you were yeah. like in this huge. Yeah, that yeah. was. It was it, just fun. It was like a. It was like a cool little, you know, featured item in there for us. So hate the clothes, love the lucid light. Yeah. What else? Anything else? Um, let's see. I don't know. I guess I like the vibe. The vibe there, as far as like the people, I felt a lot more people like less ego, more people like wanting to help, you mm-hmm. know, and like having a, yeah, more agree. of a healthy mindset. I agree. Uh, in, in, in contrast to other fitness expos I've been to where like everybody is so self-centered and self-absorbed and like, you know, the ego is like insane. Um, so I thought that was a good, you know, uh, difference. You know, it's, it's, uh, I could, you can clearly see what they're marketing towards or for. Mm-hmm. So when you go to like a fitness convention, what you have a lot of is really big, loud booths with um, like scantily clad girls, usually, that'll either, you know, just be standing around, probably don't know much about the product, but they, you know, they, they're obviously, they look a certain way. Um, and uh, at the Paleo FX booths, you didn't see any, I don't really see any of that. What you do see, though, however, is who can out natural who. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The grounding shoes that Adam uh, <laughs> yeah, found. Yeah, oh my god, <laughs> you got to tell him about that story. That's amazing. Yeah, uh, I, I I came around the corner and I saw these. Uh, this is when Taylor and I took off for a little bit. 
and we split off and I come around and I see these uh, slipper looking shoes and most of them are, are women's shoes and I see like one pair of guys. <laughs> like and penny we, loafers. We Yeah, they look like penny loafers and I stop and I ask the lady what these are and she's like, oh, these are grounding shoes and I'm like, oh, interesting, right? So she gives me her sales pitch and I believe Taylor videoed most of this and she was probably in her early 60s or late 50s and uh, the owner of the company. And so I, I let her do her whole spiel. And then I convinced her to trade shoes for the day. And I said, listen, if you let me wear these grounding shoes, <laughs> these brown, <laughs> ugly ass loafers <laughs> with my, my jorts that I was wearing that day. So I had my cut off jean shorts that day. And I thought, oh, these brown loafers will go great with this. So <laughs> I, I put these grounding. Yeah, and it was quite they, a look. The, not copper. They had carbon fiber and something souls so you know to connect me to the ground it wasn't even I, think metal. It was, I think it was yak fur yeah, yeah something like that but yeah we rocked those around for a while that was i had a lot of fun kind of playing with her as far as things that i i liked and i didn't like i did see the lot a lot of parallels as the bodybuilding it was just di- different like both of them are pretentious just for, in different ways right yeah um you know like sal said and Justin, I felt like there was this like competition on, and I, and that, that was kind of what I did towards the end when I did the copper shoes and I was looking for the blue blockers. I was trying to be like, who could be more paleo, you know, like by getting, and that's what I, I felt like bodybuilding does the same thing. And I know it's because it's, I feel like the bodybuilding thing is further from you guys. So then that it seems more, uh, silly, mm-hmm. Uh, than than paleo effects, but for me, I felt it was very similar because the bodybuilding I could connect to some of it, and I can see uh, I can get like some of the style and some of the shit I wear, so I get it. But paleo effects is probably further from my extreme. So mm-hmm. to me, I saw very similar parallels in this extremes. That's what it to me. Both of them represent an extreme for a a type of person or demographic that you know, certain people will appeal to with the bodybuilding, uh, culture. It's the, you know, stunner shades on it's the crazy Jordans and fancy shoes with the tapered sweatpants and the stringers. And then the boobs coming out at the, all the hot chicks there. Well, paleo FX, you know, you've got all the barefoot, the ugly ass, you know, five finger shoes. What do you call those? Yeah. The, yeah. the ones that Kyle had on too. Yes. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of yoga pants. Yeah, there's and lot, a, oh, and a lot of beards. Yeah, a lot of lot of, hip, of beards and yoga pants. Lots of hipsters. A lot of beard guys with yoga pants. Lots of hipsters. Lots That's of five finger shoes. Lots of blue blockers. Lots of competition on who can eat the most amount of fat and who can avoid the most amount of carbs. And and then I also saw just like in bodybuilding shows, like bodybuilding shows are heavily um, controlled by major sponsors who really dictate. Uh, where booths are, the size of things, what's being talked about there. I felt this was very similar with Bulletproof. Yeah, there. Bulletproof was the dominating force. Totally. There for sure. Yeah. They were the bodybuilding.com of totally. Paleo. Exactly. Great mm-hmm. example. Yeah. Like, I think these, and they had the stages there. Obviously, they had a big say in probably who was speaking on there. The speakers, I dropped in on a few of them. Um, Wolf was excellent. Yeah, yeah Rob yeah. Wolf was yeah, amazing. We, we saw a little bit of that. So Rob that Wolf, good. Rob Wolf was solid, and our boy, our boy, Doctor Ruscio, yeah, Doctor Ruscio, Ruscio killed it. Yeah, yeah, we're solid. Oh, Mike Salemi's little demo with the kettlebell. Yeah, yeah that went over real well there. Killed which is it. Cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people. Mike, loved I'm really it. glad he he got exposed there. So there was some good. I think there was some good outliers there as far as uh, speeches, and then the rest were like these panels <laughs> that were pretty cheesy to me. I felt like. Uh, Sal made a comment one time. They were talking about economics up there, and it was this, you know, you they put five rich people up on the on this podium, and well, it's this dichotomy, like paleo, because it, it it's almost like okay, so if you look at uh, the cultures of certain things, it's very fascinating. What, what you need, what what's really fun to do is to take a step back and look at the culture around you know the tribalism around a particular brand or belief system Mm -hmm. and it's not just that belief system it actually spreads out for example uh like even the kettlebell sport world when people were coming in i noticed like everybody had the same backpack and everybody used the same brand of chalk for example right uh in uh at paleo in, in that particular world 
there's this strong strain of uh, you know free market supporting free markets and capitalism, which people think what? But I mean, CrossFit, CrossFit's very big on that as well, and they're part of the paleo world. So, but at the same time, you've got hippies mm-hmm. that think capitalism is evil, right? right? So when they were talking economics, it was interesting to hear some of them almost apologize for being successful. Totally, you know what I mean? Yeah. Which was really, which was really interesting to me because. Well, you even got that from the guy in the back that was doing the psychedelic light show, like uh, the lucid lighting. He was like conflicted about it. He's like having to about make succeeding. it a business, you know, and like actually, uh, you know, taking money for it. And all. I'm like, what? Yeah. Well, like, that's how you spread it. That's like, how it I don't understand. Yeah. It's like, but, but you got that from a, a couple of the different booths. I felt like they're there as like a hobby and there's a lot more hobby mm-hmm. businesses there that, uh, were just like that, a little bit on the apologetic end of it that they had to charge you for something. Now, now I will say this, the uh, definitely health uh, and wellness is much more of a focus uh, here than uh, than you would find at other fitness. Conventions. Well, I don't I don't think it's more of a focus as much of it is they have a better idea. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're, you know, they got because, smarter speakers. Because, there. Because, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> that's I think, the thing. Like, because uh, I think uh, the other uh, conventions think they're yeah, trying to do the same thing they, too, yeah, right? Yeah. I think, I think, uh, the smartest they got's like Lane Norton, right? Yeah, and that's the, right. That's so their hero. I think that other conventions are trying to do that. They just fail at it. And I think that paleo. I mean, when you're going paleo, you're doing this. The idea is it's all all natural, whole foods, the way we evolved, and so. We have said many a times on this show, like you're always going to be better off going that mm-hmm. direction than any other direction. And I think bodybuilding conventions is okay. What are you lacking? Let's try and supplement that and take mm-hmm. a pill for. Or that. what builds the most muscle? What yeah. burns body fat? Yes, right. Because I didn't see a single, not a single fat burner that was there. No, not no fat burners, I no muscle builders either. Nothing like that. No, it's, no. That's where it was very different than yeah. like a bodybuilding. Very interesting. I saw a lot of CBD products. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is uh, interesting because uh, I know what the effective doses of CBD are. And some of these, like, they'd have this big bottle of CBD and they're like, oh, it's liposomal, you know, uh, absorption CBD. And I'm like, oh, well, how many milligrams of CBD? And they're like, oh, the whole bottle contains 10 milligrams. So literally, you could take the whole fucking bottle and barely get, not even get an effective dose or maybe get a little bit of an effective dose. Right. Well, it's so, interesting you, you bring up like CrossFit had no presence there. They didn't. Like I, I, I was like, surprised. It was all, well, it was like, to, to be honest, it was all about optimizing your health and nobody wanted to work out. You know, like there was some people doing stuff <laughs> outside, but it was like nobody wanted to lift weights. Ew, so. I was not. Okay. When we were all heading over, we all said this, right? There was a, when we first we're heading to paleo effects. We all kind of like gave ourselves this little talk on what to expect. And we all agreed that, Hey, listen, we're going to go here with an open mind. We're not going to, you know, talk shit. We're going to enjoy this. We're going to absorb all of it. There's a good chance that this is a a total new community for us. No one's going to know who we are, you know, so we'll just cruise the place, check some things out, but I don't want to be standing around with our thumbs up our ass and, you know, hanging out there all day, like trying to be. Mm-hmm. And if, you know, so we all kind of went in there with that things that surprised. Uh, and we all said, like, there's a good chance it's going to be a lot of CrossFitters, which mm-hmm. is uh, not a lot of CrossFit- CrossFitters are huge Mind Pump fans. So we kind of went in thinking that. And then when we got there, it wasn't like that at all. In fact, Everybody was extremely friendly. Uh, there it was, was a, a great vibe. There was a yeah. ton of Mind Pump fans that we would have never expected to be there. Uh, so that was really cool. Um, and everybody was was really warm and welcoming. It did not feel like it felt like for us when we walked around. And the discussions I was able to have with people were very... It was great. I had really deep conversations with a lot of vendors. There were, and you know, you know, our stances are, and sometimes we get um, miscategorized as being anti-supplement. We're just anti most supplements. Um, And there were definitely supplement vendors there. And when I'd sit and ask them real questions and really talk, I didn't get the 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 bullshit spiel. They were telling me honestly, and a lot of them. I'm not even joking. Like this is crazy because I've never heard a supplement vendor say this, but they would say they actually open up their conversation by saying. Of course, nothing replaces good nutrition and good exercise. And if you're doing both really, really well, here's how this may help. Yeah. And I was blown I away <laughs> by people saying that to me right. who are selling a product. I was really, really blown away. I got to meet, um, I talked to people who sold exogenous ketones and we had great conversations on exogenous t- ketones and it opened with what they don't do. 
Mm-hmm. I've never had a supplement company do that. Like, right. hey, look, this is what it, it doesn't do this, right? Yeah. Usually they're telling you they're, they're pie in the sky. Then I talked with one of the like executives of the mushroom company. What's the name? Four, Four Sigmatic. Four Sigmatic, yeah. And we had a great conversation. And again, very open dialogue, very good conversation, um, very honest. I didn't feel like I was being... You know, it wasn't a spiel. We were talking about the science. We were talking about uh, Eastern medicine and how certain things are used and, uh, you know, how mushrooms play a, a different role in one's diet and how they're not vegetables, they're not fruit, and but they should be considered an essential, like those two things and how they different, you know, uh, how they have different benefits. And so we had a great conversation there. Um, it was just, it was a really, the most fun I've ever had at a convention. <laughs> Here's one thing that I'm, I, I was a little bit... Not turned off by, but more, I guess, more skeptical was all the nootropic uh, companies because there were a lot of synthetic nootropic companies out there. And the one place where I could see this crowd pushing, in similar to the way bodybuilding pushes like fat loss and muscle building at all costs, is I could kind of see the whole push improve cognition at all costs. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, like, see, I see the same. Might thing, not yeah. be health. It's not healthy. We don't know if it's healthy. We don't know the long-term effects or we're not going to even talk about the negatives, but if it makes you, if it optimizes your cognition, then go for it. Mm-hmm. I got a little bit of that from the nootropic companies. And you know, uh, I posted a bunch of a shit ton of uh, Insta stories. Uh, actually, Adam was making fun of me because I must have posted like 30 of them. But <laughs> I took, the reason why I posted you so many of them Instawad. is I took Every nootropic that was thrown at me, because I, I said to myself, <laughs> "Let's see what." Happens. Yeah. Because you know, I'm not gonna make, I'm not gonna uh, lie. It's yeah, you guys have we a, got optimized. I took a shit ton of nootropics, yeah. and I was definitely in an altered state of mind. How about the, the <laughs> your single favorite person that you you hung hung out with, spent time with, or got the chance to talk with this weekend? Oh wow! Just one. You only get one. I only get one. One human. Because there's a lot of. There pe- was. There was a lot of. That's okay. why. That's why I want each one of you to nail I, down one. I'll mm. say. I'll. I'll First, I want to talk about Kyle. No, oh don't God. preface it with three other people to no, lead to one. No, Give me one. Yeah, Give me one and explain one. it. You don't get to fucking I'll take you, everybody's. All right. Well, it's it's an entity, so it's the more than one person. It's the it's a group. Well, people. you can't do that either. No, you can't you do have an to entity. Pick one from that one group. person, yeah, bro. Cause, cause uh, why is this so difficult? Person? Well, I, it's only the second time. Jesus. It's only the second time I've met and talked to Mike Bledsoe from okay, there you go. Barbell Shrugged. And, uh, so, I mean, I've only talked to him two times, right? When we interviewed him and then this time at, uh, at the Paleo FX, we had them over and did a big podcast with everybody. And Mike Bledsoe is one of my favorite human beings. Just a fucking great guy. Very interesting. Me and him could talk uh, forever. And he's, he's hilarious. So I, I'd say he's probably my favorite. That has nothing to do with him saying that he's just like you, right? Yeah. Right. No, I think, <laughs> I think, I think, I think I don't think he's anything like you, by the way. That's yeah. It's an interesting. No, I think, pitch for him. I, I think he said that because, uh, you he was know, just we, trying to pick a character. Well, we both, we both, yeah. um, we both, uh, have a uh, strong chemistry. No, we both have, <laughs> good, we both kind of have good conversation. Can, so Mike Bledsoe for you, Justin, yeah. what about you? Um, yeah, it's a tough one. I I actually really enjoyed the conversation with uh, Andy from Barbell Shrug. Mm. Oh, just, brilliant! Just because he's such a yeah fascinating such a guy, smart guy and smart guy, and um, you know, like I'm just really fascinated to learn more about him and uh, just the the short conversations we had, and then you know, meeting up with him again. Uh, like I, I'm really looking forward to to hanging out with him again and picking his brain so i want to have him on the show yeah the guys i want to have him on the show for he's sure a smart motherfucker yeah yeah well, he, he's he's actually in it you know he's in the lab he's in there in the in the uh you know muscular you know what blew me away is when anatomy. we were recording how we talked about i've taught i've brought this up on a the few bodybuilding episodes. history in, well that i mean him can talk bodybuilding and muscle building history forever but we we I even mentioned it, I think, three episodes ago where... Um, oh, the water. You want to have uh, certain amounts of stress, and and we constantly put ourselves out of stress, and that includes the things that we don't touch, like you need to have sleep all the time, you need to have water all the time, and yeah. I've talked about this. I talked about it so, on Raw. So proud. You called it. Well, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> I, I'm very, no, very happy. Awesome. I feel confirmed because I even talked about it on Rob's Wolf episode where I said, you know, I bet you... It's a, probably a good idea to sometimes not have water mm-hmm. throughout the day because it elicits an it's a stress, right? Or I wonder if every once in a while it's a good idea to not get a lot of sleep. It might be good for you, just like fasting and all these other things. And we were doing a podcast with uh, Barbell Shrugged, and and Andy brought it up, and I'm like, what? Yeah. And he he actually wrote a book that where he talked about that, and I was like, fuck yeah, I feel com- I feel like you know like I was on the right track. So that was cool because he's a really smart guy. I really respect him. Yeah. 
I thought uh, I Justin stole mine because I, I did get a chance to spend some time talking to Andy, and I really liked him. So since he did, someone else who we spent some good time with, I really liked was Josh from Wellness Force. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, great guy. I was gonna say, yeah, yeah Josh just, Trent. Yeah, yeah what a great guy. Just a cool story. Great guy. Very intelligent. Like really hit it off with him. That was he's got a podcast called Wellness Force, and you guys will hear it heard hear the episode <laughs> hear the past e- and present tense hear it <laughs> at the same time you, yeah you'll hear the episode that we did with him uh while we were up there soon um coming out but that was a great time with him and he it was neat because first time we ever met he came over to the place we recorded uh hit it off and then he literally just stayed with us the whole rest of the time mm-hmm. and hung out for the barbell shrug crew to get there and have a good time had a great time talking to doug from barbell strike Two. also brilliant mind so man that that whole crew and i know you wanted to pick the, them as an entity because i uh, yeah, so it's not yeah. fair because I, yeah, one of my f- alex like he was like fun to talk to and you know he's in it like one of my training. favorite groups for sure yeah you know what's what's what always is interesting to me is because we started podcasting and had no experience with how it works or operates and we just kind of did things our own way and I didn't realize how shocking it was or how different it was, I should say, to podcast the way we podcast. Because every single time we work with other podcasters, they're always like, that's how you guys uh, prepare for a show. Like you yeah. just start recording. Well, they all have I guess kind it's a of big more deal. of a formula and we, we tend to kind of just go with the breeze. Well, everybody's always like, oh my God, I like doing it this way where we could just sit down and have a conversation. I'm like, nobody else does that. And I don't know that that's not how it works. Well, so many people do the the formula interview style where it's like question, you answer, question, you answer, mm-hmm. question. Round robin. Yeah. yeah. And I think that we agreed a long time ago that we just, we didn't like that. We want, we liked this normal. And I, I feel like it feels more real that way because you could prepare for questions. Like if I send over a guy like, you know, hey, I'm going to ask you these five questions. It's like, dude, well, that sucks because then he could sit there and he could prepare yeah. for the best answer possible to make himself look the best or to present the information the way he wants to present it. Well, that's not what I want. I want what's going through your brain like immediately when mm-hmm. I ask it. Like, so I think we give that that respect to our audience that listen to us. Yeah. Like, we don't prepare for anything. We literally well, you, and we also address our audience, which is something you brought up. Uh, that I that I've noticed too, like going with other podcasters, like how sometimes you can get into like I'm just talking to you right next to me over here, you know, instead of I'm talking more, uh, bringing the audience into the conversation instead of like it's just you and me. In the well, room. I was critiquing somebody's <clears throat> podcast this last week, and that was one of the things that I was telling him that he's got to be careful of when he does these podcasts is. You know, it's the story sounds really cool to you Mm -hmm. when you're listening to it because you were a part of that story. But if your audience doesn't know who the fuck your guests are or the people that you guys are talking about, or the story you're talking about, yeah, or the story you're talking about, it just sounds, it's like being there's you, don't you hate when you're in a group of like 10 people? And you're the new guy, or you're the guy who doesn't know everybody, and then they all just start. They all start speaking Spanish. Yeah, well, they all start. (laughs) They all start telling stories of their time in college together, or some shit. And you're just like, okay, this is cool because I'm just can't be a part of this conversation at all. I have nothing to provide to it because it's not a a time that I was with all these people. So I feel like you got to be careful that as a podcaster, that when you're talking about stories or you're sharing things, that sure people enjoy stories, but to completely leave them out of it. Uh, and just yeah. have this like conversation without uh, engaging the audience, I think, is something that they got to be careful of. Yeah, it was, a, it, it was a good time all around. Oh, yeah. it was, definitely oh, will be yeah. there next year. We will be there next year and already yeah, working great. on some cool shit that we're going to do at Paleo FX. I'm excited. Bring it. Bring the bird. being brought to you by Chimera Coffee. It's the only coffee that is infused with all natural nootropics for a cleaner, calmer, and more focused buzz without the crash. Click the Chimera link at mindpumpmedia.com and input the discount code MINDPUMP at checkout for 10% off. It's the motherfucking quad. The eagle has landed. Quee-quad. All right, our first question is from Healthy, Happy, and Free. They are asking about pyramid workouts versus doing a warm up and then going into working sets. So I'm assuming when they say pyramid workout, where let's say my working set for bench press is they're ramping up. You know, let's say my working set's 225 pounds. I'm going to start with, 
you know, you know, 105 and do a set, you know, adding 20 pounds until I get to my working set and I do my working sets, right? That's what I'm getting from it. Whereas a warm up is, yeah, is there I think they're using the pyramid workout as part of their warm up versus warming up and then going right into the workout. And going so. right in. Yeah. I feel like they're almost the same thing, right? I mean, unless the pyramid workout is more intense throughout the cuz I I instinctually I've done both. Yeah, yeah, I instinctually will do that. I'll instinctually warm up, which is priming. So I, I do my priming session, which by the way, I hate the term warm up because Mhm. The connotation with warm up is that you're trying to warm the body up, get yeah, the blood flowing, yeah, warm it up and prevent injury, yeah. which that's the absolute least a warm up should do. That's a given. It's like, you know, it, it would be yeah. like me passing my driver's test because I didn't crash. Like the guy's going to be like, well, fuck, I hope not. Like, but did you, were you able to do all these other things? A true warm up should. True DMV analogy, since that's <laughs> <laughs> exactly. yeah. where the DMV analogy comes. Yeah. Oh, that's right. You just spent fucking six hours there. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, a, a true warm up should set up a, uh, a, a the most uh, effective recruitment pattern based on your body because it's different from person to person. So that means if you have forward shoulder, you're doing a certain type of priming before you bench, or if you have. Your glutes don't fire. You're doing a certain priming before you squat or whatever. So you're trying to promote the right recruitment pattern. You're trying to uh, to promote good mobility through full ranges of motion. You're trying to turn on the central nervous system so that you can fire efficiently and effectively. Then when I'm done with my priming, which honestly only takes about 10 to 30 minutes at the most. If I'm doing a real heavy workout, it might take 25 minutes, but typically it's about 10 minutes. Then I go in and the first weight that I pick – to lift with is not the heaviest weight I'm going to lift. I still will start with a lighter weight just so I can work my way up. So I don't know if you want to call that pyramid or not, but I would say ideally you'd want to prime and then pyramid. Well, I think let me, I'm going to simplify a little bit more what you just said, because I think what you said is, is an excellent answer, but might, might've confused some people with the understanding of what, what the priming is really accomplishing and how is that different than pyramiding your workouts? Here's where it's really different. Pyramiding your workouts, if we were to pyramid squats and we were to prime for squats, mm -hmm. this is how they look very different. So pyramid workout for squats means I get in, the, get under the squat rack. I barely put a hundred pounds on my back. I squat, then I go to 150, I squat, then I go, and then by the time I'm getting up to three, 400 pounds, my body is completely primed to warm up before I do my quote unquote work, uh, working sets. So that would be a pyramid. Now, when I prime my body for squats, uh, the squatting movement itself is uh, just a very, very small piece of the priming. I have to actually open up my shoulders. I've got to get that thoracic mobility going. I got to open my hips. And this gotta, is your individual. Priming. Yeah, this is my individual, right? So I got to work on mm -hmm. my uh, ankle mobility. So, so how do you do that? Maybe break that down for yeah, people. Yeah, so, so what what I'm going to do is I'm going to, and I start with my foot, right? So I start with all my foot exercises, and priming my lacrosse ball in the center, kind of opening that. I literally just did this today, just right before you got here, Sal. So I'm working on all my foot uh, connectivity, doing my ankle mobility stretches and priming. Then I get up to my hips. I get into my 90-90, and I start doing that. And then I get into my deep squat and work on my thoracic mobility with my bands, which I just posted on Instagram. Now, all of that priming or warming up, quote-unquote, leads me to having a good mechanical squat. Mm. So I could do squats all day long without doing those, and my, my squat will not look as good as it will when I prime all those areas that I need work on. Right. And those are very, very specific to me because if I don't do that, then I won't have the then good- there's interruptions in the kinetic chain. Yes. That, so if I'm just getting into the squat portion of it, I'm not addressing how everything is communicating properly and- um, you know, like the reason why we prime and we do all these things is to really solidify the, the proper channels to, um, stay ahead of the pack. So it's like your body, your body's natural inclination is to, to make, to, to, to recruit whatever process is going to be most efficient. And so what, what you have to do with the priming is look at it more as a teaching 
Like I'm, I'm teaching my body that this is the one, this is the way that I need my hips, uh, to, to function and to engage, Mm -hmm. uh, in this process. This is how I need my ankles to engage in this process and stay in this process. And, you know, all the way up the kinetic chain. So where, you know, my shoulders have to be retracted and depressed and, um, you know, my wrists, like everything, if, and this is where, you know, identifying these things that, you know, may be an interruption in that kinetic chain and that process is where the weak links are, you know, that's why we really focus on that. Like and that's, that's part of the prime process and that's going into the working set. Well, this, and this is extremely important for most all people, about the only person I see a pyramid workout or, you know, where you just don't even prime the body, you get right into your squats and you count those as your warm up. is somebody who's got incredible squat technique where they can go ass to grass and their shoulders are retracted fine. They've got mm-hmm. good foot connection. They've got great ankle mobility. If you've got great mobility, you could probably get, go right into a squat and get right into it connected and, and, and be fine and this would work okay. But you know, a majority, you know, and I'm talking like 80% plus of all clients I've ever trained in my life, uh, need a lot of those imbalances addressed before they go into a, especially a movement like a squat. Now, pyramid working to do bicep curls. Now we're talking about something totally different. Like, right, you go into your workout and you're about to go do bicep curls. Does it require this, you know, extensive warm up to get your biceps to fire correctly? No, not really. So pyramiding on that is totally different than when we're talking about compound lifts like a squat, like mm-hmm. a deadlift, mm-hmm. like a bench press, like an overhead press. These 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 big compound movements that require multiple parts of the body to speak to each other, uh, that is a whole different ball game than doing like an isolation curl or doing like a, a single uh, basic muscle like yeah, a bicep or tricep. I mean, tricep. warming up. If you warm up and you don't and you're not priming, you're what you're doing is you're you're warming up the bad recruitment pattern. You're just right. uh, strengthening the the recruitment pattern that's not ideal for you. So it would be like uh, you know a kid who holds a pencil in a very inefficient way. Maybe they just hold it with their whole hand like a like a caveman, right? And that's how they write. Or like how kids wear cold crayons. Yeah, hold crayons. And <laughs> I just tell the person keep practicing writing, keep practicing writing. They will become very as efficient as they possibly can holding it that way. Now, we know if you hold it a different way that the efficiency can increase tremendously. But before I have them practice, I have to teach them. I have to teach the body how to hold a pencil, and then we work through through that way. Otherwise, they're just going to get really good at holding it you know, like a crayon. Same is true for, for movements. If I'm not priming, if I'm just warming up, just getting warm, and then jump into my sets... All I'm doing is I'm strengthening that that recruitment pattern that's not ideal. And this is when you have people who, you know, hey, I squat all the time. I do lunges all the time. My butt, I never feel it in my butt or my glutes don't build. Or, you know, my shoulders hurt every time I bench press, so I'm not going to bench press anymore. Or when I do back exercises, I just feel it in my biceps. I don't get my back to fire or you know, bad, you know, posture or whatever. Yeah, when I squat, my knees hurt or when I squat, my low back hurts. All, all that these, stuff. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you what. Priming properly, let's say you take your take your workout, whatever your workout is right now, don't change it. Don't do a damn thing to it. Keep it the same, no matter how bad it is. Don't do any don't change anything. And just prime properly. And when I say properly, I don't mean that there's specific techniques that are better than others. I mean there are specific techniques that are better for you than others. It's very individual. The way Adam primes a squat could be drastically and dramatically different than the way someone else primes or squat. It could be very, very different. So once you learn how to prime your body properly for yourself, you can pretty much guarantee you're going to see better results out of the same workout. Significantly better results. A lot better. In fact, uh, that's the feedback we get with like MAPS Prime. That's what MAPS Prime was trying to address. Is well, that's exactly, this is exactly why we created it is so you could do, it, it comes with a compass. So an, an at-home test that you do and the test is going to point out the areas that you need to address. And those areas are how you prime your body, and it leads you right to what movements uh, are best to prime that area mm-hmm. before you go into a squat, a bench, deadlift, any of these movements that we're talking about. If you do that, okay, 100%, the very first time you do it, you will see a difference. Mm-hmm. 100%. Right it's, away. Yes. Yep. And right the, away. And the older 
you are or the more imbalances and more injuries and more issues that you've had with your body, whether it be aches and pains or injuries, the more apparent that will be. Yeah. So maybe your your 20-year-old gymnast may not be this huge drastic difference for you. It'll help. But the, the people that this is a game changer for is the rest of the, the population. Somebody who has poor recruitment patterns because we sit at a desk a lot or we have a job that requires us to use one side more than the other or your whatever. Like all these things that we do repetitively day in and day out are creating poor recruitment patterns and priming is is trying to get you to have the most ideal ones before you go into these big movements. And, and believe it or not, from an aesthetic standpoint, if you have lagging body parts or areas that you're trying to focus on and you're doing all these like great movements, like, hey, my delts won't build, but I do so many overhead presses or my back just doesn't get developed and I do all these rows and all these pull-ups and whatever. Like from an aesthetic standpoint, if you prime properly uh, according to what you want to develop more or less, it's going to make a huge – it'll make those exercises – everybody here is like lunges and squats and deadlifts, so effective for the glutes. Well, if you have an issue connecting your glutes, that's not. It's not. They're not effective for your glutes. It's just it doesn't matter what you do. But if you prime properly, all of a sudden you get you yield the benefits of these exercises, um, and they're so damn uh, effective for for certain things. You just have to be able to get the body to move the way you want. And so, uh, and I'll say this with all confidence: once you prime your workouts properly, you'll never not prime again. It makes that big of a difference. Quick interruption by our sponsors, you guys. Lots of people have been asking us how they can support the Mind Pump Mafia family. Our first one is our Chimera Coffee that we love. You guys go to ChimeraCoffee.com. That's Chimera with a K for 10% off. Don't forget Mind Pump at the checkout. We also have our Big Top Beard Company.com for 33% off. Also, Mind Pump at the checkout. Checkout. Also, Brain FM. We talk so much about this for sleep and meditation. It's Brain.FM for 20% off. Also, Mind Pump at the checkout. You guys, we also talk a lot about books on here all the time. We're using that Audible. You guys can get a free trial, 30-day trial, plus one free audio book if you go to audibletrial.com forward slash mind pump. And then last, we get lots of people asking about Ben Greenfield's CBD supplement, so we hit him up to hook you guys up. You go to getnaturedblend.com forward slash mind pump for that discount. Next question is from Shan Kelly. Which entrepreneurial mind author speaker have you learned from the most this past year? Oh wow, wow, that's got to be. Man. I mean, I th- Tom Billy's got to be up there, right? Yeah, he's one of them. Yeah, well, each of us individually probably could pick somebody here. What do you think? Um, that your that's yours. For, uh, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, well, uh, author, entrepreneurial mind author speaker. Yeah, I mean, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, uh, Tom Billy kind of blew my mind. Um, because of the story behind like what made uh, uh, Quest one of the fastest growing companies uh, in American history. People don't realize this is a, is a food company. Obviously, they make bars and stuff, but they went, I think they were the second or like fourth fastest growing company, period, mm-hmm. when, they, when, they, when they were introduced to the market. And one of the things that blew me away was they looked at the ingredients that they wanted, and whether you agree with their ingredients in their bars or not, I'm not a big fan of protein bars in general, so it's not like I'm a huge fan of their products. I'm talking about from a business standpoint. They wanted certain ingredients to be in their product, and they wanted them made a certain way, and they were told it, it was impossible from a production standpoint with all the food manufacturers. Like They're like, it's not going to happen. It'll cost way a lot of money, and it's going to be... You, you know, it's just not possible. And so what they did was is they actually invented the equipment to make the bars. Mm-hmm. So they had to create the process. A little Ray Kroc. Which, yeah, exactly. And <clears throat> which, number from one standpoint, requires balls, like shit ton of balls in the sense that uh, you're, you know, you've got to take a big risk now. You're investing a lot of money on new equipment to build your bar, or, you know, your bars or your food product. So they had to go out and invent the process. Mm-hmm. Uh, and from another standpoint, you want to talk about um, like believing in your dream. I mean, uh, and uh, I mean, not only believing in your dream, but not being married to it. And what I mean by that is I think sometimes we believe, and I've been guilty of this, you believe in a dream so much that then you fail to recognize when it's time to change or move on because you become so married to it. Mm-hmm. And part of that is because you've invested a lot of time and money. 
So, and this is a, I, there's actually a psychological term to describe this. I can't remember the name of it, but when you feel like you've invested too much time and money in something to bail, we'll stick around for something that's just shitty. It's a shitty situation, a, a shitty idea, you, but you're like, I've already spent this much time and money. I'm going to just keep pushing and seeing it through. And one thing that he did was he, he got bored with it and wanted to do other things. And so he left. I mean, he left a billion dollar company to kind of do some other stuff which is very fascinating. So from an entrepreneurial standpoint, I would say uh, definitely Tom Bilyeu. And then I'll think about something else while you guys are answering. Yeah, I think I, you definitely stole, you know, Tom Bilyeu is a big one for me for sure. But I also am very impressed with, with Ben Greenfield and oh, yeah. just just his his motor that he has, you know, and like what he accomplishes on a daily basis and just watching him work, uh, being around the guy. And uh, being involved in so many things. I mean, you see him all over Facebook. You see him at all these conventions. You know, uh, he's just, he's the master of networking and partnerships and um, this this podcasting game. I mean, I feel like he's definitely like modeled a lot of what it means to be, a, you know, a valid business person in the podcasting world. And I've learned a lot just by, you know, watching him operate and obviously like, uh, you know, helping us out and, and being that, that kind of a guy that's also a giver. So he's not, he's not just like dominating everybody. He's very, very much of a, um, you know, he'll, he'll he's reciprocate inclusive. and inclusive. Yeah. So I, I appreciate that. He knows him. how to be the center of attention for sure. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. Like he knows how to like at paleo effects. Oh yeah. Everywhere yeah. he went. He was He's a man. Though. He was the one everybody yeah. was paying attention yeah, yeah. to because he was not afraid to take his shirt off, try out the piece of equipment, take the supplement in a weird way. You know, if they had a test like who can lift this a thousand times, he'll do it. Like the guy is uh he doesn't give a shit. So yeah. if okay, so first I want to say that this was something I was extremely surprised in when we started doing this. Uh, I definitely have learned something from every guest that we've had. I've learned, I've learned a ton from all the guests we've had. Where I was surprised was not a lot of them are super business savvy. Yeah. In fact, the more educated they were or more successful they were in another arena, you know, as, as far as whether it be a book or a PhD or a scientist guy, whatever, they seem to really lack in other areas. And the business side happened to be one of the more challenging ones and more common ones I saw amongst almost all the guests we've had. So when you, you the boys point out Ben Greenfield and Tom, those are the only two that came to mind for yeah. me right away. Other than I will give kudos to Doug and the boys at Barbell Shrugged. Mm -hmm. um, you want to talk about an entrepreneurial mind that what they're doing right now in the CrossFit community, they're fucking the game up. Like there's a, there's nobody that's going to touch them for the next five to ten years. They're that far ahead of everybody else. What they're doing is absolutely brilliant. I got a really good time, a good chance to talk with uh, Doug and Doug and Mike Bledsoe are the two original guys that started it all uh, and brought the first uh, CrossFit to where where were they at? Was not Wisconsin, uh, not Wisconsin, well, Tennessee, Tennessee, Tennessee. Is that right? Tennessee, so Tennessee. The first, uh, oh my God. Little throwback. Right Tennessee, was. Yeah. Tennessee. They were the first guys to bring a CrossFit there, and they are now the first guys to create the software that helps all these other CrossFit box gym owners organize their business and be successful, and they're fucking killing it, uh, doing it. So they, I had an incredible time spending time with them. I look forward to our relationship in the future and talking more with them. Uh, before them, I've said it multiple times, I think on this podcast already, that Tom Bilyeu has been, to me, the guy who I reach out to the most when it comes to business stuff and, and want to pick his brain on what he thinks. Uh, I mean, because he's been a part of build, building a billion-dollar company. Like, So the guys that I, I want to know, like if – if you've if you've built something that's worth a hundred million dollars or more, these are the minds that I'm most interested in. And and you know they mentioned authors and books, and I just don't. I, I I've always been a big people to people, you know, person to person um, interest when it comes to business because I want to I want to actually see them in action, 
in their business, not mm-hmm. just like how they wrote it all out in a fancy way. Um, because it could be anybody that writes a book that has the ph- philosophy behind it. And, you know, like they, they, they've done this in academics well, but yep. a lot of times it's, it's a big facade. So, Oh, very much so a major f- facade. And a lot of times most of the financial success that these guys have earned is they wrote a fucking great book because they're smart. They're very smart. They wrote an incredible book. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not because they have this incredible business sense and they can build something out of nothing. Uh, Tom Bilyeu is such a great example of this because one, he just came from being a part of building, building a billion dollar company and you're now getting the opportunity to watch him build impact theory right now. So if you like these type of people and these type of people intrigue you, if you're not watching what Tom Bilyeu is doing on all his platforms and paying close attention, you're missing the fuck out. Mm -hmm. Because, And this is what I've been telling everybody that I meet that has a similar question as this, is that, listen, what these guys are doing, what what he is doing currently at this moment is unbelievable. Ben Greenfield is also really cool to watch what happens to somebody who builds a very successful business around themselves and is now trying to pivot yeah, out of that. Trying to transition, yeah. Yes, he's Ben has kind of been there, done that, made his money, been very successful, very, very successful on his own. So he's extremely impressive what he's done by himself. And now he's trying to transition out of his own company that he named after himself and what that's like. So those two guys right now uh, are, are great guys to pay attention and watch. And then also, if you're fans of Barbell Shrugged, you know, Doug and Mike Bledsoe, what they're, the work that they're doing, hands down, the, the way I look at it, these three, those three guys are that class. And, and I'm, we've interviewed a fuck ton of people, a ton of great minds, intelligent, awesome people. Uh, nobody touches them, you know who, in my opinion. You know who... Um from a not not from a business standpoint, but really impacted me on just a whole just a whole life kind of philosophy. Oh, type Paul level. Check for sure. Paul mm. Paul mm. Check uh, is he embodies, but awful business, bro. Right, awful, right. right. Yeah, but he embodies. He, he literally embodies all the stuff uh, that we preach. And the direction that we are all trying to take our own personal understanding to. Like, he is so far ahead of, and I'll just speak for myself, so far ahead of his own awareness and understanding of all these things than I am, that I can only hope to be where he's at um, when I'm his age. Like, the guy's mind blowing. The thing that Paul doesn't do well sometimes is he communi- the way he communicates it, because he just speaks, you know, and sometimes. He says shit and it's and it blows people out of the water or he says it in a way to where people just don't right over their head. They don't want to listen. Yeah. But there's so much genius in what he says. I mean, I'll give you an example, and I might have brought this up in a previous episode, but when he and it just this is just one thing that blew me away. When we were all eating dinner, and Paul Check's not a religious person, but he would consider himself very spiritual. Yeah, you talked about this just the other day. I he takes a second and does something over his food. Like he puts his hand around the food and he like says something and he eats. And I'm like, well, you're not religious. You're not praying. Like, what are you doing? And the way he explains it will blow, will blow everybody out of the water. Like I'm, you know, I'm asking myself, uh, my, my, in, my soul, if, if I want to eat this, I'm asking the food, if it wants to be eaten. And if we're going to do this energy transfer and he says all this stuff and you're just like, what the fuck are you talking about? But if you really slow down and think about it, he's being super aware and connected to what he's eating. That's all he's doing. And if we all took the time to sit there and ask those questions before we ate, we'd all make better food choices. All he's doing is he's making himself super present when he's about to eat. And so as a result, his choices are usually very, very good. So that's just one example of some of the stuff. And then, you know, his painting in between sets of his exercise and You'll hear more about that. That'd be uh, hard to eat an Oreo after all that. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Well, he's also a, he's a very good example, though, of, like I said, all the other people that we met that are brilliant. I mean, we met tons of brilliant people, so I don't want to discredit anybody else that we didn't talk about because there yeah. has not been a guest here that I didn't learn a lot from. Everybody I've had, I feel so blessed to have interviewed all these great minds, but 
when you ask a question like entrepreneurial mind, yeah, for sure. that totally yeah, the ones that, that we carves made. off a whole shit, a shit ton of them. I know because yeah, there's there's few of those. Yeah, and there's there's it's one thing to build a, a business that's very successful for yourself, right? Like I, you're a good entrepreneur. You can you can you built it up enough to sustain a living for yourself. You're comfortable. You have the things that you need. Maybe you have like an assistant, and and you're good to go. Like that's one type of business. And for me, I think almost everybody that we meet has at least that skill set. But what I'm really drawn to, because I've been in my career where I get into, I've been at the sticking point of taking a company to a $100 million company and what it takes to build a business to that level, it takes a whole nother breed of a person, a whole nother uh, mind. And the closest mind that I think we've come, come across that is like that would definitely be Tom Bilyeu. Mm -hmm. Next question is from Rachel D. Uh, Rachel is a trainer that has hit a plateau with the number of hours she can train and needs to find me time. What is the next step in advancing her career? Isn't she a, a cooking channel chick? What do you mean? I don't Rachel, know. Rachel D.? Oh, I don't no, know. Is it, uh, isn't Rachel D. a Rachel. name? No, it's Rachel Ray. Oh, Rachel Ray. Rachel Ray. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is a good question. Do so you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of when people, parents in particular, um, moms more specifically, become uh, martyrs for what they're doing. Like, you know, it's all about the kids. It's all about them. I don't do anything for myself. And as a result... Um, they're very stressed out. They become very miserable, and they find that they're and they're not aware of how ineffective and inefficient they are at doing the stuff that they prioritize, which is you know maybe their children, or for for example. Or you see a lot of guys doing this. You see men and women doing this with business. Like mm. I'm business, 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 business. So much so that I won't take care of my body. I won't take care of my health. I won't meditate. I won't do vacations or, t or do things with my family. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, what people don't realize is they become very inefficient and ineffective. And I, looking back, I can use myself as an example. When I managed uh, health clubs, now I had nothing else. I had no other responsibility. So it really didn't matter. I loved being at the gym. But I would be there from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., usually sometimes seven days a week. And if I look at the amount of money I earned and divided it by the amount of hours that I worked, I wasn't earning that much money per hour. Yeah, I was very, very ineffective. You're just occupying space. I was, and, and I, time. I just, and most of the time I was there. If I'm being quite honest, I wasn't being uh, efficient um, with with my job. So what you, and if you're a trainer and you're super focused on building your business, not taking care of you is going to hurt your business uh, as as well as the fact that now you're realizing that you don't have that me time and you'll start to resent your clients and your job and you won't have the energy and all that stuff. So from a business standpoint, it's very, very smart to schedule in me time, period. Like take care of you because you cannot pour from an empty cup. You cannot devote and be your most effective self if you're not optimizing yourself. So that's number one. Now from in a more specific, uh, for, from a more specific standpoint as, as a trainer, if you're training you know, 10 clients a day and you're charging $70 an hour um, and you're really good at getting clients and you're, that's a ton of clients every single day. You need to raise your rates. Raise your price. There are, uh, there are certain signals in the market that you need to be wise to. I've had trainers actually come to me and tell me, ooh, you know, I work so many hours and I have a waiting list of three months. Well, your pricing is off. Yeah. You you have you are not understanding de demand uh, of of your products, and if you have this long waiting list, what you're doing is you're uh, you're you're hurting your business. Number one, people aren't benefiting from it, um, and you're not uh, maximizing your time. What you should be doing is rather than charging seventy dollars an hour and working ten hours, is maybe charge a hundred dollars an hour and charge and train seven hours or whatever. You know, do the math and figure out where you can make up the difference. So now you're training less. You're making the same amount. You're probably more of an effective trainer to the per people you're training because you're not so spent. Um, and you're reading the demand uh, of your services a little bit better. So, uh, number one, if you're, hour, if you're training shit tons of hours, you probably need to charge more. Number two, do and schedule time for yourself because it's going to make you a more effective business person and trainer. 
Well, this I like this question because it, it feeds into what we're currently talking about at Mind Pump Media right now. And we real soon here are going to kick off a uh, seminar that will mm. be for free the first time where we're going to invite trainers just like yourself to come down here. So this would be something that I don't know where you live, but it would be worth your plane ticket because it will be free. And in the future, we will charge for stuff like this where we are going to hold a, you know, how to, how to make six figures in the fitness industry. And one of the things that I know I for sure want to discuss is what, what I've thought about fitness for the last at least five to six years is that it, it has to evolve. It has to change. And we are in the decade right now where you're going to watch that happen. And I think that the trainer model that we've seen for the last 20 plus years is going to drastically change. I think with the amount of tools that are out there and technology that we have and the ability to feel and stay connected to people virtually, uh, literally minute by minute every day, I think is going to um, devalue uh, that one-on-one time. Now, does that mean that nobody will ever have a one-on-one trainer where they pay top dollar? No, absolutely not. There are still going to be clients who have lots of money and they want that private treatment of having a trainer standing in front of them. But for the majority, we are heading in the direction. And we kind of saw this happen after the dot-com era crash. We saw this major transition from during dot com, we saw mm-hmm. it was almost trendy to have a trainer because everybody had the money. Everybody had this extra income to spend on a personal trainer. And health and fitness has been on an uptick for quite some time. And, and now everybody people had to scramble to create a group class. Exactly. And, and, and so yeah. then you saw the dot com era crash. And like what Justin just said, soon trainers like myself, I remember this time, were like, oh shit, like. I actually have to work to get clients. You know, there was a time there where it felt like people were constantly walking in the door and looking for training. All I had to do was convince them on how long they needed to train with me or what we needed to focus on. And then I went through this transition of, oh shit, I actually need to get aggressive and go like find people to train. And then it got really challenging. I thought, man, not everybody can afford it. And this is one of those things that this is where they're cutting back. You know, job people are getting laid off, their wages are getting cut. And back then, training was looked at as a luxury. And so luxury things tend to go first. And so training started to go away. And so those trainers uh, that still were used to that income, like I was, and I wasn't willing to let that go, I had to get creative. And one of the ways I became creative was I started to create these boot camps that I was running outside of the gym that I was currently working at. And this allowed me to supplement my income. So I, I actually increased every single year as a trainer, but it didn't get easier every year. In fact, it forced me to look outside and do that. Well, now I feel like we're looking at, you know, the evolution of the uh, group training classes have now evolved into CrossFit boxes, Orange Theories, you know, all these uh, membership-based classes with, that are small, intimate, 20 to 40 people tops. And you get a personal trainer in there, so you feel like you're kind of getting one-on-one, but you're not really getting one-on-one. And it's a monthly fee that's super affordable, like $100 to $200 a month. Well, I think the next evolution to that is even less of the time with the trainer and even more affordable. So if you're not already transitioning yourself into building a business around YouTube, social media, live streaming, a lot of what you're watching Mind Pump Media do and we're far from done right now, this is what I believe is the future of personal training, and you will need to get on board or find a company like ours when we're all in place to help you build that. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> I think now, too, like as you're in a sort of transitional part of, of your business where you've pretty much maxed out on the amount of hours that you can, you can, you can do per day <clears throat> and fill in with clients, um, like Sal said, you have to you have to start you know you address your rates and and start opening up more time for yourself to venture into other ideas. The thing about the the thing that I love about the fitness industry the most is how much room there is for people to venture off into all kinds of different niches and um, there is a lot of directions that you can go even 
now that we're kind of merging into the health and wellness side as well. Um, so <clears throat> my suggestion is to really, you know, start opening up your time more. Think about what kind of products that you can create, uh, whether it's a book, whether it's, you know, a, a tangible product, something you see within your niche or get more education specializing yourself to separate um, and, and voice something very specific. So that way you're more searchable and you can actually, as you increase your rates, it makes more sense because you, you're so specialized. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not necessarily on that. Uh, we're not specialized. I mean, we have, we definitely have our backgrounds that are kind of specialized, but what we're doing, I mean, unless you want to create a, a super group, like we got where we're trying to, we're trying to become a platform to, to provide, um, quality specialists to come into our system and, and, you know, get exposure that way. Definitely going the specialist route, I think is, is something to look into and pursue. Oh, you, I, I really like that. I, uh, I was going to ask you guys, what do you guys think about, what do you guys think for most average trainers? What do you think the most hours they should train per day to maximize both their career, but also get it's it's the it oh makes them really good at being a trainer. That question you're asking is a really tough one. It's to a answer. tough yeah. one, right? It's tough because I've done like twelve hour days, you know, like I smashed the hours out. Yeah, but while. you're you're pretty exceptional. You're an exceptional yeah. trainer. I, I know you very well, and I know that the last client is going to get the same level of commitment yeah. and service as the first. Right. Well, no matter but, no matter how good you are, you're bur at, you'll burn yourself out. Though. No matter how good you are, as those hours increase, your your the attention to detail, mm. the service you're going to provide. I don't care how good you are. Like so, you could argue all day that hey, I can I can handle eight, ten, twelve in a day. But if you ask that same person, do you service twelve people better in a day or four people better in a day? That person would be lying if they yeah. said they service. Yeah, because I think um, what I used to tell trainers that worked for me when I had like my private facility, right? As I would tell them, your goal is to train thirty hours a week um, and figure out within those thirty hours, you know, what you need to charge and make. To be, you know, to basically what your target is, because you don't want to make that having to work forty or fifty hours a week. Personal training requires a lot of energy. Like, yeah. there's a lot of jobs where if you're kind of in a bad mood or kind of tired, like you could just sit quietly at your desk and do your job and, you know, do your thing. With personal training, your client shows up, you're on for that whole hour. You you can't, you know, be quiet. You can't be off. You can't be tired. You can't not be compassionate. You can't not be you know empathetic. You have to just be awesome pretty much all day long. So if you're training eight clients in a day, you are on for eight hours and you're working it's for exhausting. eight hours. It's very, very uh, emotionally and mentally uh, draining. So um, I used to tell my trainers like six hours is what I recommend for most people. Mm -hmm. Everybody's a little different, but it, you know, six, for me, you know, I would go and of course. I would always push the limit, but I found when I trained about six, I was like, great. You know, eight was pushing it. 10. I used to do a lot of 10 hour, 10 client days. I went all the way down to like three or four a day max. Like that's how I operated yeah. for a long time. And well, I loved it. Well, here's, here's something for you to think about it. I don't know if I've mentioned this on the podcast before. I know we've talked about this many times off air is that if you don't know that YouTube by next year will be the number one search engine. So it will pass Google. It's owned by Google too. So it's not like that's a big deal to them. But think about that for a second, that if you're a part of a generation right now that let's pretend this was when Google first started. And if let's say you were starting, like Justin said, a you're trying to find a, a niche in the fitness industry, that something that you love to do or that you bring to the table that's unique and different. And imagine if you could be the person that most of the searches come up for that arena or that area. And to put that in perspective, you can watch what Mind Pump is doing right now. There's a reason why we drop a video every single day. And every day, it's a, it's a, it's a very slow. Like we, we add between 40 to 60 subscribers every single day. Yeah. And it's a long grind. And But when you think about it in 10 years from now, when we have thousands of videos that are out there with thousands of different titles, all related to health and fitness, it's we are trying to dominate the search engine. And hopefully with good quality videos and good information that you can trust, 
that over the next five to 10 years, you know, when people go to YouTube to search for something related to what we talk about, we're going to be one of the top uh, YouTube channels that pop up. Well, as a trainer, you know, I wish somebody would have told me this way back when it first started. I didn't really understand how I thought YouTube was more of a entertainment thing when it first started. I didn't look at it as like a business tool like I do now. And so if you're a fitness person and you're not looking into all these different platforms as a tool to catapult your business, you're slowly bleeding out right now. If you're just doing the basic nine to five or nine to 10 o'clock, whatever your hours are of training clients, there's nothing wrong with that. If that's where you want to be, if you if you want to make your X amount of dollars, you love people, you love seeing them every day. You know, for me, I was over that really quick. Like I it would only a couple of years into personal training and I knew I wanted more. I wanted to do something else and that it was very wearing and tired. I get tired all day long of giving all my energy to these individual people. So, you know, if you're not already looking in the direction of, you know, different social media platforms to leverage well, let's talk about that because look what's already happening with employers, how they're looking at your following yes. uh, going into. So say this job right now that you currently have isn't panning out and you're trying to apply for another job in another gym, they're going to look and see what kind of following you have versus the that's other crazy. person I didn't even that's think with of that. you. Oh, that's yeah. true. There's many companies right now are adopting this as part of your application So if you're process. a trainer, hey, I want to work at you know XYZ gym. They're going to look at everything. Plus, they're going to say, "Well, what's your social media following, and what's your..." and which makes sense. Yeah. And I and I know this. Wow. I know this is going to. It's already happening. Of, yeah, this is going to this is going to irritate some people. But I'll tell you right, and this is the truth from a business as a, from a business owner perspective. If I have you know trainer Justin that has the uh, social media following right, and it's all big, and then I've got you know trainer Lane who's got a uh, that's a PhD brilliant mind but doesn't have any social presence whatsoever. I'm actually going to lean towards Justin because when it comes to converting into dollars, I know that his reach and his community is going to pay off in my business more than even this PhD guy who may be able to answer more questions than he, than Justin could. So mm -hmm. just keep that in mind that when you th are thinking from God, a, that's got to apply for sales jobs, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. There's I companies know. already didn't that even think of that. This is part of the application process my mind was just blown. in the future. <laughs> it will be mandatory. So if you're not already, you know, there, you're, there's either two, there's two types of people right now that are using these platforms. If you look at which is, it cracks me up too when people talk about some of the shit that I post. I'm just like, you know, I don't give a fuck. Like, this is for business for me. Like, all of my all my social media, I turned that on to assist the the business. It was not. I'm not a consumer. Does that mean I don't go check out my family and see my friends? Sure, I do that every once in a while. But 99 percent of what I utilize it for is for business and business relationships. So. If you're not already thinking that way already, you should be. This is the yeah. type of stuff. Start growing now. This is the type yeah. of stuff that going away. we will be covering in, in the seminars that we do in the future. So hopefully we can help out. Next question is from Fairyland, who is asking, have you done Pilates? If so, do you think it's beneficial for someone who weight trains? So I did Pilates for about seven years. And, uh, you no, did? I'm just kidding. Awesome. No, awesome. Awesome. Tell me all about it. Yeah, before I... Uh, no. So I'm I'm very very familiar with Pilates uh, because I've worked with Pilates instructors as clients, but I've never taken Pilates. Now here's something that you want to consider when you're doing a modality that is based on a particular uh, style or technique. Is that the style or technique becomes the priority? And what I mean by that is uh, when you do Pilates, there is a there is definitely a Pilates way of doing the movements. There are Pilates exercises. Uh, same same thing go, you know holds true for other types of movements. Yeah. Do you have an example or? Uh, well, you've, you've you guys have seen Reformer uh, re work before, right? Yeah, you know, Pilates, by the way, was invented to train uh, ballerinas and ballet um, performers. Um, it's designed to create lots of stability. Um, lots of long lines Core stimulation. and not long muscle bellies. No. That's fucking bullshit advertising. Can't do that. Can't change your muscle belly uh, length, but long lines, because when you're in ballet, that's what you've ever watched, you know, high level, uh, ballet performers. You can see that it's all about these. these it's a, it's a very particular type of movement. It creates this, uh, this, uh, illusion with the movement and it's very, very, um, you know, it's branded very much ballet. Well, Pilates, 
was designed to train ballet performers to develop the stability and strength to do ballet, okay? Uh, resistance training, on the other side, is all about training your body. It's not about doing a particular style or whatever. So I can do resistance training for anything. I can do resistance training for ballet. I can do resistance training for football. I can do resistance training for rehab. So uh, there is no form of exercise that is more moldable than resistance training at all. Nothing comes close. Nothing. There is nothing that comes close to resistance training's ability to mold and form itself uh, around the individual. So that being said, some of the uh, drawbacks of Pilates is if you have uh, imbalances, for example, they say, oh, it works out your core. Well, if your hip flexor dominant, Pilates is wrong for you. Because if your hip flexor dominant, almost all the lower body movements are going to... It's going to reinforce that. They are going to really reinforce hip flexor dominance. I have had a fucking hard time training some of these clients and instructors on correcting their hip flexor dominance because they did years of Pilates and they reinforce these hip flexor dominant movements. So then when I go do other exercises, it's like so solidified uh, that... Mm. The only success I've ever had is I've had them take time off Pilates while we correct imbalances, and then they were able to go back and then have m more favorable recruitment patterns. Now, that being said, if you're relatively healthy and you're aware of developing imbalances, Pilates does some fucking amazing stuff. Like You want to talk about uh, stability, um, especially uh, limb extended ability. Uh, uh, stability in the hips, stability in uh, uh, upper back posture, stability in the shoulders. Um, Pilates is amazing. It's mm. incredible. It's like I mean, strength yoga. It's uh, <laughs> well, no, it's actually it's actually very very different. Like yoga, no, it's... when you're when you're in a position for yoga, you're holding a position and staying very tense. And with Pilates, there are movements with very short ranges of motion. So you are actually moving in repetition within these short. It's, it, have you ever done seen bar classes? Bar is mm. it's not Pilates, but you can see how it's uh, related to Pilates. Mm. Yeah. So if you just do resistance training, and you're really strong in the gym, and then you go do Pilates, you're gonna you're gonna find yourself shaking. It's gonna suck. It's well, very specific. What's interesting is uh, you know Dr. Andrew. Andrea Spina, mm. uh, he actually like somebody had had coined like the the functional range conditioning as like a hybrid of yoga and Pilates, but added all this like scientific data and and a study behind it. So he's just the way that he organized it is different, but it, he pulled heavily from Pilates. Yeah, I, I called it strength yoga because I've done yeah. it before, and that's what it reminds me of. Is is like doing yoga type positions with repetitions and strength. So that's why I called it that. Um, I think it's just like. Did you do reformer Pilates or did you do? I've done both. Matt, actually, Matt Pilates, uh, yeah, yeah, I've done both. I've actually dated a Pilates instructor, so I've had my fair share of Pilates in my life. And uh, I I think it's great, but I also think it's just like what Sal said. I mean, I think of it like Pilates, yoga, running, rowing. These are all, all these. These are very specific type modalities and movements that could complement a a weight training program, but they're totally different. Like Sal said, weight training program is very specific to you, right? Unless you're running some generic group class, you know. Ideally, you're lifting that's uh, movements that are specific to your body. That's ideal. At least that's what we talk about, and that's what Maps is all about is trying to find that for you, right? But I also believe that if something like this, if you go and do it and it gets you uh, moving in a way that you wouldn't move and you don't injure yourself and you do the proper, if you got maps and you're priming your body and you're doing the things to work on the imbalances, then I'm all for it. In fact, if I had to compare it to rowing, running, yoga, I would probably put Pilates up there and in, in one of the better ones of all those uh, less detrimental in comparison uh, to like running mm -hmm. uh, or doing something intense like rowing. So that I would, I, if you're, a, if you're doing the right weight training, I think it could totally complement that. And I think if you like, and you love doing it, I think it's awesome. Now, personally, I would create my own, like, let's say you're going to do, you got maps three times a week and then you're thinking about throwing Pilates in there two times a week. Well, 
I would throw two days of priming in that two days of fortification sessions or prime instead of Pilates. And then you're, what you're doing is you're taking the benefits that you may find from Pilates and you're being very specific to what your body needs and you're spending an hour a day on those off days. That's what I would do. You know what I find interesting is uh, Pilates has some of the best um, inadvertent marketing that I can think of. And what I mean by that is if you're a woman and you want to get in shape and you know Pilates was designed uh, for ballet dancers and you and you know what like the top ballet dancers look like yeah you're immediately like i'm doing pilates oh, yeah. right meanwhile if you're that same woman and you want to get in shape and you're like hmm i, I think i might want to lift weights and you look at bodybuilders <laughs> you're probably like fuck that i'm not going to do that right um crossfit became very popular among women because they did such a good job of having like examples of women who lift weights and how they look and you had these women that looked amazing and they're like hey i deadlift and squat and whatever incidentally the exercise that build the most muscle but all of a sudden women were like i want to do it because they want to look like those people same reason why when yoga first came on the scene no men did yoga now you're seeing men doing yoga but at first it was because the example or the pinnacle of yoga was like this woman who did it's all this like yeah. really really smart marketing men would benefit greatly from doing Pilates as well. I mean, if that's your thing and you want to train in, in those ranges of motion, you're, you know, like Adam was saying, you've already got a pretty good hold of uh, how your body works and whatnot. Um, t- t- go take a Pilates class and see how it feels. You'll be surprised at how challenging um, it is. But uh, like anything, it's the detriment is it because it's a specific uh, form of technique. It's a specific type of movement. So I have trained, my, my cousin actually is a very, very high level ballerina um she's she's performed in new york and she's the lead in uh i forgot what show i think it's a nutcracker oh, wow. in sacramento San no Jose. Shit, huh? yeah she's very 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 talented been doing it for a very long time has gotten scholarships uh, uh through ballet and if you look at her um of course she's developed a baller you know the, the muscles that are very heavily, heavily worked in, in ballet so she's got very she walks around with this ridiculously tall posture and you know, nice shoulders and all that stuff because those are the, you know, because of holding the position stuff. But if you take her in the gym and you have her lift weights and you put her in other ranges of motion that are not um, actively trained in ballet, things start to break down. Like if you have her do a deadlift, it looks like a plie. You know what I mean? It looks yeah. like she, she wants to get down like a ballerina would yeah. because uh, her body has had to mold to the art or to the sport. And mm-hmm. so if you just do Pilates, then your body has to learn and create recruitment patterns to make it as efficient and effective at well, Pilates. It's, it's a sport in a sense that kind way. of because right. it's not really that beneficial to the joints. Like I've had a lot of clients with knee problems that were dancers, uh, just, knee and hip problems, just because of the yeah all day long. And if you ever and you never repetitive seen repetitive movement, if you've ever seen a ballerina's uh, feet, you can see the beating, absolute beating that they oh, take yeah. because of the, the, up the on technique. Their tippy toes. Oh like. yeah, but if you weight train properly. Um, then it, again, it molds to your body. So I can train anybody and there is no set like form or structure. Like we love, I love squats, right? Barber squats, one of the best exercises you possibly do. I can have someone come in and who can't squat and I can still train those muscles using different movements depending on their body. If you're doing Pilates you're, or, or you're kind of limited, you know what I mean? Like here's the Pilates movements and unless you have a really good instructor who can modify the fuck out of things, you're a little bit limited. So um, that all being said, again, I want to echo uh, you know what Adam was saying. If you're if you're resistance training, you're doing anything right, and you want to add Pilates and you enjoy it, go for it, man. It's activity, it's fun, and you'll get a completely different uh, type of workout. Uh, with that being said, Mind Pump is still offering 30 days of coaching, and it's still for free. All you gotta do is go to mindpumpmedia.com, opt in. It's free and you'll get a ton of incredible information including uh episodes that are time stamped uh th- where we talk about particular subjects so you can list literally click on what you want to learn whether it's pro- protein fat wellness meditation whatever and studies studies that de- that defend and accompany those uh those topics uh also um leave us a review on iTunes we pick the best ones or at least the ones we like the most and you'll get a free t-shirt Lastly, if you want to ask us a question that we'll answer on episodes like this one, 
The place to do it is mind is on uh, Instagram and it's Mind Pump Media. That's the name of our page. My page is Mind Pump Sal. Adam has a personal page. It's Mind Pump Adam. And Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.